Welcome back to the Shine and Thrive Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Monica, and today you are in for a freaking treat. Let me tell you, my guest today is Rachel Branke, and in my eyes, she is a superhuman. She is so freaking inspiring to me. Okay, get this. She's a mom of five kids, a multiple seven-figure entrepreneur, and a Team USA athlete. She's also been featured in Forbes, has written seven books, and has helped 365,000 entrepreneurs in 50 countries. And in the meantime, while she's accomplishing all of this, she's also done a handful of Ironmans in the process. Also, some of you may have heard of the Law Tog, which is a legal resources resource for photographers. So you can actually purchase contract templates and all the legal stuff that you need for your photography business. Rachel is the creator of this, and she is also a freaking lawyer. Like this woman just blows my mind. So if you are in need of a boost of motivation to learn how you can make your wildest dreams happen for yourself in your business and in your life, then you really want to keep listening to this episode because she just shared so many golden nuggets that I feel so motivated and inspired and energized to take with me for the rest of the day. And I also have a quote that she mentioned that I don't know if it, I think it just came to her. I love what she said that I'm going to literally write down on a sticky note right now, as soon as I'm done recording this intro, and I'm going to put it on my bathroom mirror because it really gave me an aha moment that I really needed in this chapter of my life. So in this episode, we covered how to handle the invisible load of parenting while also running a business. And she will definitely have a thing or two to say about that because she's the mom, a mom of five kids, um, how to create a business to allow you to have the life you desire with the freedom to actually live it and how to be fluid through different seasons in your life. And so much more. These are just like the top takeaways. Um, Also, I do want to ask, remember to screenshot this episode if you enjoy it and get value out of it and share it in your IG story and tag both Rachel and I, because that way you can be the catalyst to help spread the message that guess what? We can design the business and life of our dreams. Like she is freaking living proof of it. And you may just help change someone's life with that one share. I just love how the ripple effect can be in action here. So I don't know about you, but there's been so many times where I have found someone shared something on social media and it actually me finding that resource or that person actually helped change my life in such a positive way. So be that for someone else, make sure to share it because we can do hard things. We can do things that seem impossible and then end up with a life that we are just feel so fulfilled by. So yeah, with no further ado, enjoy tuning into this episode and yeah, I'm excited to connect with you when you do share on IG. Hey, Rachel, welcome to the Shine and Thrive Photography Podcast. I am so excited to connect with you. And I love how we're like, actually, I just noticed our patterns are very similar. <laughs> we're on the same wavelength and we didn't plan this. I promise. We are. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to chat with you. And um, I think just to start off the episode, because there's so much that we can dive into, um, but I'm very curious to learn and hear from you. Um, about your mission statement. And I would love to know what that means to you. So your mission statement is real biz, real life. And so I would love if you could expand on what that means to you. Yeah. So as a business consultant, intellectual property attorney, primarily for photographers, I love business. I love everything about business. Well, mostly taxes and you could take it or leave it, but uh, (laughs) I love everything about business. However, business shouldn't be our life, right? Business should be a supporting actor to what we want to do with our lives. And I think that sometimes that as um, women or as a mom or just being active in your personal life, you're like, oh, I need to have something for me. And we have a hesitancy to kind of justify business as like a self-care just for us. It is till it isn't, right? And that's where burnout comes around. So I give that as an example of, you know, create the business that you want so that you can have the end life that you want, because, you know, I started my entrepreneurship journey because I had cancer. And so I've always been really acutely aware of the fact that we have very limited time. Doesn't mean that my trajectory has been like straight on, right? I've been perfect with everything. I've had my burnout. I've had my justifications, but um, definitely, especially during pandemic, the more focus of creating that business to be able to allow me to live the life that I want. And how long ago did you, um, 
you know, start your entrepreneurship journey? Uh, 17 years, 17 years. Yeah. Holy damn. Okay. Me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say holy damn because I'm like, what? Wait, you do not look like that was like oh, 17 okay. years ago. <laughs> it's funny because I could say for me 11 years now and I'm like, oh my God, it's so weird being in the double digits. And then you're like, where did time go? Where yeah. did the time go? Um, so actually, uh, I would love to dive into this question because I know that back like 17 years ago, um, you, you had a transition where you quit your corporate ladder climbing, right. Um, after you found out you had cancer, like you mentioned, um, and then you ended up staying at home and working on your business while during nap time. Right. Yep. And then you were a server in the evening, which yes. I also server life. I feel you on that. I, I did that for a while. <laughs> I, you said you loved it. I loved it. Me too. Do you ever have like fantasize in your head? Like, you know what? I would love to just go back for like a couple months just to like, <laughs> I actually thought that I was like, you know, if I ever needed to do something for like extra money, like I, I would totally do it because to tell you what I could do an entire podcast episode talking about the lessons that I learned in biz for business from waiting tables, like 100%. Upselling, marketing, all that. And just like customer service. I loved it. I, yes. I, I and this. always saying yes. And like their, their needs are always what you just say yes to. Yeah. A hundred percent. Oh my gosh. I love that. Um, I love that. We both fantasize about that a little bit too, especially like <laughs> being an entrepreneur, it can get lonely. So sometimes I'm like, Oh, you go into work, you see people, you hang out with people, you know, like it could be, it's a fun environment. You like people can drink like all of that. So yeah, I feel like you. you can do that in your workplace too. It might be a little frowned upon, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then after, so you had that chapter where you were doing that, you were working on your business while at home during nap time and then a server in the evening, but you mm -hmm. found that it wasn't working for you because, you know, the tips barely helped support your family at the time. And then in the evenings, when you wanted to hang out with your family, you couldn't because you were serving. Um, so I would love to know, like, can you paint a picture of what shifted for you? from that point into actually creating seven figure businesses and then, you know, having international speaking opportunities and yeah. providing employment for like to over 12 people. That, that's incredible. It's and on so top of that, holy <laughs> shit, I know that you did all this while being a mom and competing on Team USA like this is why I bow down to you. Yeah. So, please, <laughs> well, the I will. I will say though, it's not that straight trajectory. So you know, during when I was doing the waiting tables and working on my business and going through cancer treatment, such my oldest. The reason I knew quickly how long I've been in business because it aligned with when he was born. He's seventeen, like a foot taller than mm. me now. <laughs> so he's like a physical manifestation of like how my business has grown. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, I still kind of wrestled at the time. Now, just for some context, I'm going to date myself to the audience a bit here. This was before the days of Facebook. This was before the days. I mean, this was MySpace days. And if oh, you yeah. don't know what MySpace is, you're definitely <laughs> way younger than me. Um, but I share that some context to say there wasn't like this plethora of information out there of how to learn to run a business or how to do it. Like if you wanted to learn to run a business, you had, everything was behind a paywall or you had to schlep down to a conference center when one came to town and pay thousands of dollars and learn, right? There wasn't this online learning and all of that. And so I was trying to cobble together what I could. And like most people, when you're first in your business, you're not even sure if you're going to be able to make a go at it. But I always knew that I didn't fit in the box, but I didn't know what the you know, what outside the box looked like for me. So I still struggled in this time period against like societal pressures and familial pressures of got to go to college, got to work for corporate. So I actually did go back into the corporate world for a little bit while I was continuing to build my business because we financially needed the support. But I also was still struggling with this whole idea of, can I make it a go? Can I not? And I really love that transitionary period because I learned a lot. And I also learned by going back into corporate that I had made a good decision to leave it in the first place. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, so, um, but then I... By the time I had baby number two, uh, which was when I was in law school, I had decided I didn't want to go work for anyone else. I still kind of had a little period um, during law school and after law school where I was like, you know, lawyers don't 
have a flexible business, you go and you're a prosecutor, you work in an office. And, but I had two babies during law school. So we're up to three at this point. And I just was like, you know, corporate's not for me at the time. My business was making way more than I was even going to make working as a, you know, in a law office or as a prosecutor. And your business at that point was business consulting. And I had a couple online, like apparel stores, sticker, think Etsy before Etsy. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some kind of like the, the designs, girlfriend, those designs, are <laughs> well, they will never touch the light that. of day. No, <laughs> You're no, like, no, I refuse. no, <laughs> I do need to go. You know, I still get, I, the, the sites are still there. I still get residuals. I mean, they're low now because I don't yeah, want cause you, yeah. but they're horrible. So <laughs> maybe one, maybe I'll have to pull that out if we'd ever do a future episode, but you know, but that actually is a good example of, I didn't go into business thinking I wanted to design stickers. I just knew going into business that I wanted to be in business. And I went through a couple different iterations during this time period, this back and forth with corporate, with needing to financially support family and trying to figure out like what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so that's how law school came about. But yeah, by the end of law school, I was making fairly decent money uh, for, through business consulting, helping businesses. That time period was still kind of before this big plethora of information. It was just starting to kick up. Mm-hmm. Facebook was around by then. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just I just knew that I wasn't going to hack it in a cubicle or an office somewhere. And so I made it happen. Now, that doesn't mean it was easy. I still had my burnout and back and forth and but that's fine. And then I enjoy it. So now what I have today is I have my uh, law firm that I do contracts and intellectual property work. And then I own the law tog and fit legally, which are legal resources for the law talks for photographers fit legally is for fitness professionals. And then the overarching Rachel Branke is where all the business consulting and coaching stuff is. Wow. Incredible. And question, I was like wondering, because you created a resource for photographers, did you, were you ever, did you dabble in photography as well? I did actually. So that was one of the businesses that I had, um, was growing right during law school and in law school. And that really was the catalyst for, you know, paired with this idea, you know, I was making the money with business consulting, but it showed me there's a need for photographers for the legal information. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because by the time I graduated, I was getting plagued with questions of my fellow photographer friends because I was doing photography. It was was really a flexible job or a business that I could run during a law school that really helped to support us. And I love it. Um, And I still do photography now, um, but only really for my business consulting clients. So you have to be a consulting client locally or if I travel and then I can do like marketing and branding type photography services. That's incredible. Okay. There's so, like so many questions I have for you from, for you, from what you said, <laughs> well, I'm, winded, I know. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like it's so good. I think what I'm, what I'm very curious about actually, especially with being a new brand new mom, brand spanking new mom. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, tell me about how did you stay so focused and, and motivated and energized while navigating at this point three kids. And I know you have five now. And I I honestly, I have, I just have been, and I'm like, I don't know if I can have more. Like, so I'm (laughs) like, yeah. Like what, what were some things that you implemented into your daily life to be like, well, I want both. I want to be a mom. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to move my body and be an athlete. Like all of those wants, because I am the same way. I freaking, I love movement working out. I used to be an athlete back in high school and I had a whole chapter when I started my, my business when I was younger, where I was so focused on my business. I let that part of me go. And then it came back for me the last couple of years. And then I became pregnant and then now I'm going through postpartum. So I'm just starting to like get back into movement, but now it's a whole new chapter. And I'm like, Oh, uh, so I have a baby. So now I have to actually schedule things even more so with my workouts. So how did you navigate that daily life of like parenthood and entrepreneurship and being an athlete? Well, you just stole my answer from me, honestly. It's knowing the chapter of life that you're in, 
right? And recognizing, because I can point back to like five main burnout times that I've had. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, my entrepreneurship journey wasn't like a straight trajectory. There's ups mm -hmm. and downs and curly cues and all of this, but the big burnout moments were when I didn't um, recognize the chapter or season of life that I was in. And I was really just like, must mechanically <sighs> implement the schedule and do this, right? Like let's take pandemic, for example, girlfriend, all of a sudden I went from my regular schedule, working out every morning after I dropped kids at school and doing my business work to virtual teaching five kids. Oh. Okay. I love teaching adults and I love my children. I do not love virtual learning with my children. Teachers, yeah. I bow down to you. <laughs> you are amazing. <laughs> but my point with that is I couldn't keep the same schedule. I couldn't do things like this during the day because they needed my attention and it wasn't fair to them because of the world circumstances. So had I not been vigilant and understanding, okay, this is the season of life we're in. It's temporary. Well, at the time we didn't know it was going to yeah. be temporary. <laughs> yeah, we hit, literally had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but so that is a big one. And I know it sounds so simplistic, but I work with so many uh, photographers, business owners in general, but photographers, and especially moms who come to me and they're like, I am so burnt out. I don't know if this is for me. Well, first of all, before we make a decision, if business is for you or not, let's see like what the emotions are that you're having and where it's coming from, right? All of our emotions are valid. It doesn't necessarily mean that we need to make a decision based on them or dismiss them. So we want to dig into kind of the root. And I would say nine times out of 10, when I'm working with somebody, it's because they are, they got into business and they got very mechanical. And I'm one of those that like, I'm very much bucket based. Like every quarter we do this every day, we do this, we can schedule it all out, which is actually point number two of how I was able to do things. You schedule it, but your schedule has to be flexible within the season of life that mm. you're in. So the majority of people that come to me that I work with who feel burnout out when they're like on the verge of quitting, um, we step, take a step back and go, okay, let's start with, what is the key phrase? Build a real business to have a real life. So actually we need to define our life and our life circumstances and our life goals. Mm -hmm. Then we want to fill, put the business stuff now. And I understand that if you're listening to this and you're like, oh my goodness, but what about money? I was there for many years and I, my family, family was financially dependent upon me. We needed the money. So I get where that fear and all that comes in, but you're not going to be effective if you're burnt out. And so you're going to have to take a step back and see season of life, schedule the things the best you can, and then get a return for every action that you're doing. Right. So let's take, for example, this podcast, and I still do this. This is the same approach I take now, even though I have team members and I have support and help with the kids and things like that is when you reach out to me, it's like, hey, you want to do a podcast? I'm like, yeah, sure. We internally run through this evaluation of, okay, can we get three good returns out of this one action, right? Of this like hour so long podcast. Well, first of all, it fulfills me intrinsically, right? Yeah, I get a connection with another business owner because sometimes it can be a little isolating. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm getting in front of a new audience, right? You know, there may be some photographers that are in your audience that overlaps with the law talk, may not. So that's another benefit. Third benefit is you're probably going to post on social, get people to drive to my social, my engagement starts increasing there, which feeds the algorithm beast. And then at least four, when you publish it, we share it on our blog. And so what that does, it gives me like search engine optimization. Five, it also gives me credibility. It gives me content. Like you see, like I'm just tallying up all these things. So we go through this of every action for the most part, because in the beginning, part of the burnout, especially if you're operating from a place of fear, you want to it, you, you ignore your season of life, you start to ignore your schedule or you're so rigid with your schedule. And then you try to jump on every opportunity, even though that's not really going to pay off because either you don't want to reject someone, you're afraid of being rejected, or you're just like, oh my God, I have to do all the things because my fam family needs the money or I'm afraid to fail. Uh, so I say all that to say the three approaches of how I was able, didn't do it perfectly. And I'm still fine mm -hmm. tuning this because we use the structure now though is once we've defined real life and real business and what that looks like is recognizing the season of life. Like we were just, the team and I were just having a conversation today about how school's ending. So my entire schedule is gonna change mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks because the kids are gonna be home. So the season of life that we're in, um, scheduling what we can. I always schedule my personal stuff first. So like in the morning is like my training time, my self time after I take the kids to school. Um, 
any errands or things that I need to get done around the house. And then I'll go into calls like this. And then the third is making sure that I have at least three, it's almost a pros and cons list, right? Three positive, great returns that I can get out of every one action that I'm taking. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's basically staying in your zone of genius and being yeah. very intentional with your time. Um, this is something that I can relate to. Obviously, I think everyone can relate to burnout. And of course, I hit my strongest burnout about six years ago when, you know, photographing weddings, editing, culling, album design, blogging, wearing all the hats in the freaking business, right? And then <laughs> I was like, well, eventually I want to have kids and eventually I want to have more freedom. And because I'm like, I got into business to have more freedom for myself, but I was chained to my freaking desk as a photographer for 16 hours. It didn't make sense. So that's when I got on the outsourcing journey and I started learning how to actually outsource successfully and still get the quality of work back that I wanted. Right. Um, so that is, that has been a huge help for me. Um, just like you said, you have a team, right. That can help you with those tasks that aren't in your zone of genius, because only you can be here right now podcasting, right? Um, yep. And I love how you said about leveraging every action you take. It, can it be leveraged in multiple different ways, right? And um, so that's really cool to hear that that's what you were doing because um, I'm trying to figure out like the best way I can navigate this new chapter of being a mom and entrepreneur as well. And I've realized, I already knew that time was so valuable. And I knew that it's so important to stay in your zone of genius, but then ever since he was born and ever since I'm like, okay, I can work during nap time. And you never know how long nap time is sometimes. No, So you're like, furiously, yeah, gotta finish, gotta do this. yeah. <laughs> but that's where I sat down and I'm like, okay, what really is priority? Number one, yeah. what is the yeah. first domino that will hit other dominoes down? And that's what makes me feel more at ease every day. At the end of the day, being like, you know what? I didn't work for eight hours, but I worked for two and I got, so, I got so much shit done in those two hours. Cause that's the most important shit to get done. Well, and right? I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, um, atomic habits is a really popular book right now. It talks about the compound effect of 1% a day. It's not a new novel thing. It's a really good book, but like yeah. the idea of just moving the needle 1% a day is so incredibly important. In fact, as an athlete, I look at it as I'm not going to go I've done it. Don't do this. <laughs> I went from having lung surgery to doing an Ironman in like eight weeks. Do not recommend you will hurt yourself. And I did hurt myself. And wow. so you're not going to go out and say, I'm going to run a marathon and do it tomorrow. You're going to do incremental steps every day. That's going to compound. So, cause you're exercising and toning the muscles and feeding yourself and replenishing and resting and business is the exact same way. And so I think it's so incredibly important that just what you said, like the whole domino thing, I could just visualize it because I've given this overarching, like three points of like, Oh, how do you avoid burnout and all this sort of stuff. But when you're in it day to day, you think you got to make these great gains in order to be successful. Yeah. And it's overnight successes are created after like 17 years of 1% compounding per day. So I approach every day tangibly because we have those days where we're just like, Oh, don't want to work or you're just not yeah. in it or it's nap time. Right. Girl, I remember hiding in a bathtub. Okay, stick with <laughs> hiding me in a bathtub. Stick with me on this. So yeah. my kids were, my youngest had just been born. He's pro he wasn't even crawling yet, and so the third, or my, not my youngest, my third <laughs> was the youngest at the time. I'm sorry, and I had I accidentally answered a client phone call, one of my business consulting clients, and I know accident, but I did. I thought it was like the school or something, so I answered it, and I didn't want to in my fear based, right? I didn't want to say, Hey, can I call you back? I could hear like my four-year-old, she was completely fine monitored in the house with me, but she's like jib jabbering, just talking, like not really even to me, to her dolls or whatever. And I remember climbing into the bathtub that was still <laughs> wet from like my shower a couple hours before and like hiding, trying to talk to my client and trying to hurry up, get off the phone to hear like what they needed. So I could like sketch out the strategy plan and email it later. And I just, I still can feel like the wet of the bathtub and how ridiculous I would have looked this when I walked in. But it's one of those situations, like, it's almost like you force yourself, you can force yourself into that schedule to work because you feel like you have to. But the reality is now I try to approach each day with like our four uh, foundations. Like we want to at least do one thing for self one thing for family, one thing for like our clients or community, our, um, 
audience and then one thing for like our social community right mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be a grand thing for example like on the community aspect it could just be simply me sitting down for 10 15 minutes and sketching out how i can better support the homeless shelter this year right uh, it doesn't have to be this massive action but just doing little things so like on days because i've also had chronic illness so like on days where i'm just like flared up autoimmune don't feel well at least if i can target those That's what I strive for without trying to do all the things, but also at the end of the day, especially the the season of life that you're in right now is giving yourself grace that if it doesn't get done, it doesn't get done. But you hit on something that I wanted to mention. You know, you talked about the 16 hours a day at the desk and went into outsourcing. I, for a long time, wore all the hats in my business. And sometimes I still wear hats that my, you know, my fingers don't necessarily need to touch the tasks. But I remember a very distinct moment that we were at Disney World. And I remember I'm in the bathroom trying to answer emails because I was the only customer service person. And I was like, this is absurd. I'm in Florida and I was probably big and pregnant because I was almost every year during that time. And I was like, this is ridiculous that I'm taking my bathroom break of having to answer customer service or inquiry emails. Like there has to be a better way. And I immediately went and hired someone out of my audience to be my customer service. And then that opened the whole outsourcing can for me. But um, yeah, I just, it's, that was one of those like just pivotal moments. Cause you hear about outsourcing, you hear about this, if it's you like live it. And then you realize what am I doing? Uh, Yeah. I, that just came up for me when you're talking and I was like, I completely forgot about that. That was like the iceberg. (laughs) It's so, I love that you mentioned that. And I love that you remember the actual moment because I love hearing what was the breaking point for people of being like, this cannot go on anymore. Right. And then how many, and how, like, as soon as you got that help, weren't you like, wow, holy crap. Why didn't I not do this sooner? Yeah. Like it's well, this big, like boulder that we think we have to like push up a huge hill. But then once you're in action and you get that momentum, you're like, oh, this yeah. task got, got me a little bit closer to finally getting this outsource and getting help. And then before you know it, it's smooth. It's like working like like clockwork. And it's hard when you're looking at it from a financial standpoint and you're like are really dependent upon the money, right? So if your family needs it to live, it's very difficult to try to um, justify, you know, yeah. that outlay. But I, and I think the pendulum can be on one side that is good. You know, you maybe take a little bit less home in order to open up how many hours a day for you, for your family, for self or whatever else, but you can also swing it too far to the other way. I see many business owners try to outsource all the things. And what they end up doing is abdicating their responsibility as the head of their business. And so I'm going to throw the little legal in here a little bit, like photographers will come to me, the law talk, which you should for me to help you on legal stuff. But if you come to me at the firm and they're like, oh, just whatever you recommend, I always go time out. It's not just what I recommend. Mm -hmm. Like you are the lead of your business. I want you to be equipped with the knowledge because what if I get hit by a bus tomorrow? What if my cancer comes back and I close my firm? Like, I love that you trust me, but I would rather empower you to be able to make the decisions. And so if you're in that space of, oh yeah, I want to outsource and all of that. I say start small, but definitely don't get to this point of completely abdicating responsibility. In fact, going back to what we were talking about awaiting tables, one of my favorite companies, and many companies do this now, but at the time, I don't, I mean, I worked for a few different companies as I moved around, um, but Outback Corporation, um, they require for you to be a manager that you have to work every job in the restaurant. You have to do hosting, busing, dishwasher prep. You have to do all the jobs, right? And I love that because yeah, so it, it equips you with that knowledge, but it also helps you when it's outsourcing. You know what to look for, you know the value in it. And it also helps you to have a better expectation of what to expect or how to communicate to those you are outsourcing. I'll tell you what though. Leadership and management has been my, that's my Achilles heel. It's the one thing that I've really had to work on the most uh, because as us as thought leaders of our business, we work differently. We think differently than other people. Uh, So bottom line, what I'm saying is yes, outsource. If you've had a Disney bathroom stall moment, here's your sign (laughs) outsource, but also equip yourself to understand like what is involved with that and be responsible to be the leader 
of that person and don't completely just abdicate and just expect things to poof happen. Yeah. That's one of the biggest mistakes I, I see photographers make. Like if you, cause you know how, so I don't know, you probably felt this way, but a lot of photographers feel like the last thing they have time for is blogging. They can never keep up with their blog or like post their recent session or wedding. Cause they're like, ah, I have so many other things to do. I don't have time. So I see this mistake happen and I've made this mistake. And this is how I learned about the mistake was I was like, this is something I'm not doing and I want help with it. So I'm going to outsource it. But if you don't know how you want something done, you don't know how to communicate that to that person. And then you're just left feeling unsatisfied. You don't understand why they're not getting it, why they're not reading your mind. And so I love that you said that you have to, for, you have to like actually have gone through the experience of living it and knowing how you want the thing done in order to communicate it effectively. And then that person to take over. That is so freaking important. I'm glad you said the blogging thing, because if y'all aren't blogging, you are for a world of hurt. If, and when the social media channel mm-hmm. that you're loading all your content onto. We talked about the great, the return on stuff. If I go and create an Instagram post guaranteed, you're going to find that caption expanded on my blog post because I want multiple returns for every action. Right. So yeah. you're going to be in for a world of hurt if, and when the social media platforms phase out or you lose your account. It's yes. Happening. You just reminded me that's something, I mean, I do for me, I do the leveraging cause I have every episode goes on to podcast platform, YouTube, and uh, my show notes, which is my blog basically. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's all searchable, but I'm like, but my actual wedding photography stuff, I still can do a better job with SEO. So you just reminded me of that too, because SEO is very, it's, it's kind of like this, like thing that seems so visceral and like technical that I think a lot of photographers are like, I'm scared to touch that. I don't know how to, I don't get it. You know? So it's like afford to not touch it. Cause think about when you photographer listening want to go, where do I find photography contracts? Where do you go? Google, what drives Google SEO? You know what I mean? So like you can't afford to not. And I raise my hand. If I had to put in order my weaknesses, leadership and management, I'd probably put SEO right below. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So actually I want to, I want to touch on a post that I saw that you posted um, on the IG um, and I'm going to read it. And oh, what do you mean? Oh, no. I love how you're like shaming yourself. You're like hiding. You're like, no. Is it my real? Is it the real that I did? No, okay. Okay. Cause I try to have the curated feed. Then one day I'm in the grocery store, <laughs> no, hair is greasy, no makeup. In fact, my mascara was like smeared down my face and I did a reel and it's my freaking top reel now. And I'm like, you people. Oh, I'm that's like, amazing. Oh, well, now that I know it's your top reel, you got me curious and I'm going to go see it. Now it's going to go even more top. <laughs> that's about marketing. That's why. By the marketing. way, that I love that stuff. Like whenever people show up like that, it's so relatable and it's just like, oh yes. Show up it's all so greasy good. and with makeup down your face. But I love what you wrote here. Like you, you wrote this out because you said, um, I'm just going to read it. Uh, Rachel, how do you do everything you do? How are you so put together? That's what you say. You hear a lot from your audience and you wrote this. I don't some days. I just don't, I'm still battling chronic illness, post-cancer and lung disease issues, not to mention emotional traumas, but you know what? The beauty of being your own boss is that you don't quit or you do, or you do more, or you scale back. You do you depending on how you feel. That's how I do it. I don't do it all. I don't succeed every time I make a move, but I do get to choose how I do entrepreneurship and life. That was just like, so beautifully said, so beautifully put together. That's you. (laughs) That is you. (laughs) Isn't it fun hearing it in retrospect? Like, whoa, that came out of me. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, that's a good writer, man. What, what emotions was she feeling? I apparently was in my field that day. <laughs> yeah. It was so beautifully said. And oh my gosh, it totally, I love how you said earlier of it's okay. If you don't get the things done as you're navigating this new chapter, like that's what I've been trying to remind myself is like, you're now in this new chapter. So you're, it's okay that you're not going to be able to get as much done and all of that with work. Um, but this just shows that we always have the choice, right? We always have the choice to choose how we feel and then act on how we choose that we feel. Right. Um, so I would love to maybe get a better understanding of like, 
when do you, when you get hit with like a new season of life and you're in it and maybe you don't even realize you're in it yet. And then it hits you and you're realizing, okay, things need to be, I need to be more fluid. I need to be more flexible. I need to just change things up. How do you do it without feeling overwhelmed? Like, how do you do it without being like going into the mindset of it's hard, it's hard. Cause that's yeah. where I get so frustrated with myself. When I get into that negative mindset of it's hard, it's like, no, Sarah, go back to just being fluid and like being present. So what's funny is actually my preteen daughter got out of the car this morning. She was in a mood. She's me, <laughs> like mini me. And I said, you can control two things, your attitude and your effort. And she's like, <sighs> and I said, oh, that took a lot of effort to roll your eyes, huh? And she like slammed the car door, but it's true. Like, it's one of those things that just reminding yourself that you, and we've heard the phrase, like you choose your heart. Right. And I'm getting up there in years. So I'm getting to the point that I want to enjoy what I'm doing. Whereas, and I think it's easier to be said too, when you're further along in your entrepreneurship journey, but don't be mistaken thinking that, oh, when I hit 50 clients a year, when I hit six figures, when I hit seven figures that you're at the mountain summit, right? It's little summit. There's always going to be another summit, you know, that you look towards or want to do. But to answer your question of like, how do you not get overwhelmed? Well, first of all, I'm an audible processor, my poor family and my team. I just say things to kind of process through. I don't need you to fix anything. So that's where I start. My team gets like an earful of slack and they'll just, they'll just write back. We'll let you finish. Cause they know that I'm just trying to like work through like the frustration and overwhelm. And then once I get it out, I very much try to go back to how do we define real business, real life for this season of life, right? You can have the big picture of like what you ultimately want to see, but if you sit there and go, okay, how the circumstances change, let's take like pandemic. It went from a, oh my God, what the hell am I going to do with these five kids <laughs> to, okay, got that out now just work methodically. And it's going back to that 1% consistency every day mm -hmm. of ease yourself into it. And I think one of the best things I've ever, ever had said to me is in business and in life, you're not making the decision. You're making a decision, a decision that can be changed. So let's take, we're into a new season of life. You recognize that it's changing, whether you cognitively recognize like with coming into summer when kids are going to be home or just you start seeing the symptoms, you know, your response to a burnout. Um, but just really methodically approaching of like, what does, what do I want this season to look like? And honestly, this is going to sound really weird. What is the bare minimum that I have to do? What is the minimum viable actions that I need to do to move that 1%? And actually it's funny. You said the Boulder thing the earlier, because I use that example a lot in business that when you are in a new season of life and you're making an adjustment, or you're just starting business or a new project, it can be overwhelming and a lot of effort to get it going. But once it gets going, the inertia, the little taps, keep it going. And so, but understanding with that is that's not one big major decision other than, okay, let me figure this out. Every other decision after that is a decision and it's a decision that can be changed. So this summer we have sketched out what I think that my schedule is going to look like. If after the first week I'm losing my freaking mind because I feel <laughs> stressed out, we only made a decision. I am in control of this so we can change it. I'm not beholden to a faceless corporation telling me I have to do podcast interviews on Wednesdays or any, you know what I mean? Like, and it, it, it's funny when I share this kind of vulnerably and transparently, much of what holds us back or holds us to rigidity is ourselves and this mm -hmm. idea of, well, I made a decision. I got to see it through or else I'm going to fail. And oftentimes you're going to end up failing by trying to fight against and not being fluid, like you said, with the decision and giving yourself permission to change it. So I say all that to say, process it how you need to process it. Our emotions and feelings, whether it's overwhelmed, fear, you know, whatever you feel, whenever a season of life changes, validate, recognize it, work through it. It exists, but it doesn't mean it has to dictate your decisions forward. And then your decisions after that are a decision. They're not the final decision. We get to change it. And I sound a little fortune cookie when I'm saying all this, but when you put it into practice, especially many of us that are in business, we're very like, especially if you're fear-driven, we're very much, okay, this is the structure. This is what we got to do. 
And we're trying to fight. It's almost like trying to swim against the tide versus utilizing it to help you get to another location. Um, it's really yeah. easy to fall into that pattern and not give yourself permission. In fact, I am, I know my personality type. I am so much that way that I, I almost have my triathlon coach. I know enough now because I'm far enough along and competing at Team USA that I can do my own trainings for the most part and such. I really almost have her to keep me from injuring myself and to give me permission for days off. And I know that makes you go, but you run businesses. How's that possible? It's because like the pendulum we talked about earlier with like outsourcing, being able to be self-accountable can also be too, this pendulum can be swung too much to one side to the point that you don't allow mm-hmm. for flexibility or grace or permission with yourself to yeah. change. Because you can't even notice how you're acting because we have so many thoughts and actions that we need to take in a day that we can't actually just maybe process and realize what we're doing. Right. Oh my gosh. We get into like action items and this is where the busyness does not equal business aspect comes in. It's where we're busy work, busy work, busy work. Even if it could be moving the needle, it's still going to end up being busy work. If you're using it to distract away from strategic thinking, from slowing down, um, any of those sorts of things that are really going to help leverage you forward. I, yeah. I'm a huge proponent on if you are a business owner, especially a creative, and if you're a creative that like photographers that doesn't necessarily is not business inclined, even more so you need to exercise that muscle, right? Of like sitting down, shutting everything off. Don't listen to this podcast. Don't listen to the law talk. Sit in silence for an hour and just strategize. And think about what you truly want with your business, because I'll tell you what, there's the operation of having that on paper. When you get into these seasons of overwhelm, you're able to reorient back to it. And it sounds so simplistic, but I'll tell you what, people that become million and billionaires, they didn't come because it's some quantum leap, some amazing, it's consistent, repeated actions over and over and being focused, but also giving self grace. Yeah. And that's when you, man, it's so... (sighs) So many times when I find myself being like, I don't know what I want. And I, <laughs> I tell myself, Sarah, really, really, you don't know what you want. And I'm like, okay, I go meditate for 10 minutes, sit down, sit with myself. And I ask myself, so what do you want? And guess what? The answer just comes, yeah. <laughs> right? It's just sometimes like, yeah, getting quiet and even just declare, like declare. And once you have that clarity and that quiet, then you just, all you have to do is declare what you want. And be like, okay, what am I going to do to start getting there? I love that you even mentioned that you have your, your trainer, uh, even though, you know, what you're doing, I kind of, it's so funny because I'm such an outsourcing nerd. My brain went to this point where it's like, you know how in order, like what you just said, sometimes you just sit in quiet to even separate yourself from the busyness, from your busy mind, and then gain new perspective. It's like, you're, you're outsourcing that perspective shift yes. that you need, because like, that's an outside person yeah. that's not in your head. And they can tell you straight up, like, Rachel, you need a day off, Rachel, you're like pushing me too hard. Like I can see this. Right. So, um, I love that you even mentioned that. And one thing that just hit home with me right now, so hard is you saying it's a decision, not the decision, because I don't know who else listening or you, I I'm like, I can be so indecisive where I spent can spend 10 to 15 minutes deciding, do I go for a walk now or do I go later? Do I go? And then at 15 minutes have passed. So I'm like, I could have already gone for the walk or been back. halfway there. <laughs> right. And it's like that I've actually never heard that. And I'm going to write it down on a sticky note. I'm going tape, to tape it to my mirror today to just like, remember that because it just, I feel this like weight lifted off my shoulders. That I'm like, it's just a decision right now. Like you can change it. So that was so helpful. You had so many golden nuggets there. Um, Well, funny with that, with like the decision-making you're talking about, like, I don't know. I don't know. I do the exact same thing when I go to restaurants, even though we go to the same (laughs) restaurants, I end up, I almost get overwhelmed and paralyzed with options. And even though I'll tell the server, I'll keep coming back. I order the same shit every time. (laughs) But my point with that, with business is if you are finding yourself in a rut of like constantly choosing the same thing. And it's not really necessarily benefiting you. Like I'm always like, I'm going to go to this Mexican restaurant and I'm going to pick something new because I want to try the menu girl. I've only ever had their fajitas. Like I've (laughs) never branched out to anything else because it's, I've not really sat there and cleared my mind to be like, what do you really want? I know this sounds like it is funny in a way, but we do it in business too. You could end up making 
what you think are active decisions, but they're more of like passive decisions that aren't really serving you simply because you're overwhelmed and you feel like you have to make a choice. You have to make Mm. a decision and actually making no decision sometimes is good too. I mean, I'll be hungry at the Mexican restaurant while everyone (laughs) else is eating, but sometimes making no decision is better than doing, you know, doing the same thing or just Oh, whatever. I don't care. I do that sometimes with my team and they'll be like, no, you do really care. Or you're going to care when you wake up from this. I don't care attitude and realize that you did have a preference and we're going to have picked the wrong one. (laughs) So love you guys. If you're watching this, but (laughs) actually to expand on your metaphor, um, I love the, uh, by the way, I have to say this because it's so funny. I don't know if you've ever when you're serving experience, have you ever had someone say, yes, I would like the fajitas. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you just say a dirty word? <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm like, oh my God. So funny. So now I always call them fajitas just for fun. Fajitas. <laughs> I'll be like, no, sir. That's the strip club down the street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But to expand on your metaphor, even like, cause I'm the same way I stick to my comfort zone when it comes to food a lot. I am more adventurous when I go to like a really nice restaurant and I'm just like, tell me what you recommend. I will listen well, to you. Because they don't have your you. default option there. Yeah, that's true. There. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. But like, yeah, to like even in business, if you stick in your comfort zone, like mm-hmm. for too, too often, too much, you don't know what you could be missing with other strategies or solutions. And you're just, I'm in it. I'm in my comfort zone. Just like when I used to edit all my photos, I'm like, this is my comfort zone. I only know how to edit them. No one else can do it as well as I can. And then it was like, well, do you want to just be chained to your computer or do you want actual freedom in your life to like live your life? So, um, yeah, I love that metaphor so much as well. Um, what, another thing that I saw, I saw on your Instagram that I was like, Ooh, that is good. I need to whip it out during the podcast. Um, and it was very short and sweet. You wrote, um, uh, the quote unquote, that will never happen to me. End mm-hmm. quote. Mindset is an extremely expensive one. Trust me. I freaking love that so much because whenever, whenever I hear people say, oh, that's not possible. I can't do that. Blah, blah, blah. I get so enraged inside of me <laughs> because I just want to shake them and be like, but you can do so much more than you think. Like, hi, let me, let's, let's sit down. Let's have like a coaching session right now. Let me coach you right now. And I've learned to not give unsolicited advice that way to loved ones. Right. That's why I do what I, I do now. I get to have a, a space to coach and teach photographers, let that un- out of me. But, um, I love that so much. Is there, is there a, anything that, you know, if someone is listening right now and they have something and they really want, and maybe they're, they have a goal that they want and, you know, but that's like not possible if, and that can't happen to me. Like, what would you say to them? Why is that an expensive mindset to hold on to? I mean, I could give you the legal example. I mean, obviously like, um, oh, I'll never have a legal issue. And then all of a sudden your client's suing you and you're having to spend tens of thousands of dollars on something that could have been prevented by like a contract. But let's take the blog example, like you talked about earlier, our learning SEO. Every day that you're not learning blogging or doing blogging or learning SEO or the combination, because you need to have good SEO in your blogs, you are losing money because that's every day that another potential client is not finding you. So let's just assume that you're going to get a new inquiry every day. So if you wait an entire month, that's 30, 31 potential clients that did not inquire to you because they couldn't find you. So how expensive is that? Are you dumping money into other things that is not giving you nearly the return, right? Um, I I just, I I love blogging. I think it's one of the things that's never going to die for businesses. It's so incredibly important, but I always try to look at things, not just the money savings or what I could save later, but what are the opportunities that I'm losing in between? Because even those 30, 31 potential clients, you're not going to book them all, right? But you never know how many out of them will book you. How many of them will refer their friends, even if they don't book you? Like we can never really quantify the lost opportunity, but why would we even want to allow that to happen? Right. Okay. So I totally, I read that quote from the perspective of like mindset of like, um, it's not possible for me like that, like me creating a seven figure business that will never happen for me. Right. Like that's where the perspective I read it from, but I actually see your perspective. I'm like, Oh, okay. The perspective of, uh, no, I'm fine. Like I don't have to invest in my education to, to grow more, learn more, or I don't have to invest in 
proper contracts because that won't ever happen to me. So actually, let's go down that road and let's chat about that. So maybe could you give like the legal example as well? Because Mm -hmm. I definitely also want um, you to talk like touch on legal stuff because your resources um, are incredible and your legal resources. And every time in my community, I see someone post, Hey, like, how do you guys go about getting contracts? Like for photographers that are just getting started, they're feeling like, where do I even start with that? That overall, I personally remember that feeling 11 years ago. I'm like, what the hell legal stuff? I don't know. Right. (laughs) So everyone's always like the law talk, by the way, everyone always recommends your stuff. So it's like, yeah, your resources are amazing. So yeah, maybe expand on that from that Mm -hmm. perspective. Before I go into that, I do want to say, I love that you told me what your perspective was because I was just having this conversation actually with my personal trainer today. We talked business while I'm lifting weights. Oh, so um, fun. <laughs> and we were talking about how a consumer's perception is their reality, right? And so you mm-hmm. see how I intended that post to be by through my explanation, but you took it a different way. Neither one is necessarily wrong, but it can show you how the receiver of a statement could, they're looking through their lens, right? Yeah. They're looking at it through like where they are. And so it could land differently. And I think that's just a good lesson when we're doing like marketing or working with our clients, especially when we're trying to avoid client issues. Uh, we may know how our business works. We may know what our workflow is. We may know like what we're going to do, but the client doesn't know unless we tell them. And that's actually where contracts come in. Contracts help to set the expectation, let them know what the process is going to be, have it all for legal protection there. Um, The most common example that I give on this, of this whole like expensive mentality, and I've seen it girlfriend time and time again, is photographers to get in and I get it. Like we've already talked about how in the beginning of my business, I didn't have a lot of money. Everything was going back to support our family. It's wait and table. So I understand being in a position where you maybe get into this business. You don't have a lot of money. Um, you're financially dependent upon it. So all your money is going to feed family, but I would encourage you with this example that I'm going to give you to really take it to heart because You get into business and you either have the mindset of, oh, I'll never have an issue. I'm just small beans, or I don't even know if I'm going to be able to hack it. I don't even know where to get a contract. You have no excuse for that now. You now watch this and seen this, but the, um, the idea of having to go out and spend five, $600 on a contract. I've actually, let me give you the very real example. I had a client that actually came to me at the law firm and was like, Hey, will you custom draft contract? How much it will be? And I said, sure. It's going to be $800. Cause it was pretty extensive. And there, he was like, no, no, I don't want to spend it. I said, okay, I wish you luck. Not six, seven months later, he had a client that decided to file in local court against him and went to court. He had cobbled together this contract himself on the internet thinking he was saving $800 and it actually worked against him. It didn't provide the protections. And in the US, like if you end up in a legal situation um, and you're in court, it's not like on TV where they're like, oh, whoever wins gets their attorney's fees paid. There's only a couple of ways that happens. Either it's written in the statute or it's in your contract that you sign with your client. Neither of that was applicable here. So Bottom line, this client came to me, didn't want to spend the 800, ended up spending because of appeals and everything, because his client would not let it go, $10,000 on attorney's fees. Guess what he still ended up having to pay in the end? The $800. So a a savings of $800 cost him $10,800 in months away from business and mind and energy and everything stress Mm -hmm. on a legal issue. Now, would a contract necessarily completely prevented the issues? No, but here's the thing. And this is what I think is so important. You know, we just mentioned that a client's perception is their reality. Oftentimes legal issues are not one big major issue. It's not like you didn't just show up at the wedding because you're laying on the couch eating bonbons. Oftentimes it's all little, that shows my age, right? That, I don't know why that word makes it just makes me laugh. <laughs> it's, just a random word. it's also spelled funny. It's like, bon, bon. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's small little 
like erosion in the confidence or knowledge of your client. So photographers listening, you know, you may think that you're communicating effectively. You may think that you're giving the full picture, but every time that there a client has to question something or wonder something, it erodes their confidence and erodes that their that maybe this, you know, they start, start to think maybe this wasn't the right decision. Yeah. And then there's a straw that breaks the camel's back. We can try to prevent that through contracts as much as possible. Like the contract is good to have if you ever end up in court. The majority of people aren't going to end up in court, but it'd be good if there's a potential chargeback. It's good to point to just if your client has a question so that you can say, okay, yeah, here's what I said, how long it would be for your, you know, your, mm-hmm. your, your wedding gallery to be ready. Um, and it just sets expectations. And actually from the front end, it boosts that buyer's confidence that makes your clients want to buy into you more. Yeah. They're not actually scared of contracts. That's a complete myth. And if your client are, they're probably not the clients that you want to have. Assuming you have a solid contract, you've explained it well, and you guys have a good rapport, right? But on its face, like a yeah. contract is not going to keep you from getting a client. It's going to give you all these benefits, legal protection, expectation setting, you know, bu- building a buyer's confidence and allows you to, prote- you know, protect yourself if there's a problem. hundred percent. I actually, um, I recently hired a copywriter and she sent me over the contract and her whole process and system. I was really impressed with it. And she, with like going through the contract, I was like, perfect. Now I know what, what the expectations are moving forward, what to expect when, how all of that, everything was set and clear. And that made me trust her and the process so much more a hundred percent. And so it actually made me excited to sign it. Cause it's like, yay, we're on the same page. Everything is noted. Um, yeah. and also like you mentioned, you know, the person that wanted to save $800, um, it's an investment and we call it an investment because it actually pays off so much more in the long run. Right. So it's an investment in future proofing your business. So you don't lose potentially more money down, down the road. And it's a write-off. It's well, it's a write-off. And I'll tell you what, I've got all sorts of lenses here. You probably spent more on your body and your lens than you would for the 800. And that contract's going to last longer than this body and lens. That's true. Last. That is very true. Over and over again. So yeah. <laughs> this oh ain't going to protect you in court. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. I'm like, we have hit so many incredible like topics and points today. I love where the conversation just went and flowed. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your time and everything. Is there anything I always love to ask? Cause is there anything else that's on your heart, on your mind that you're like, I just want to let it out and share yeah, with the listeners. I, you know, something I thought about earlier, kind of when we were talking about the burnout is it's okay if you get into this and realize business is just not for you, right? As long as I think you've done the evaluation of is this short-term burnout, is this long-term burnout, is this just not for me? If you realize it's really not for you, there is such a market for people that want second shooters, associate shooters, assistants, mm-hmm. editors, like you, just because you stop doesn't mean that you're a failure. In fact, you're a yeah. failure to keep going and you're unhappy because it's going to permeate into your clients, into your work, into yourself. So I just encourage you because I've seen this a lot, especially with wedding photographers that came up earlier when you mentioned that of shooting so many weddings of uh, that. So I often hear so many times, I just want to shoot. And I go, well, why don't you like that's great. That's freeing. Like give yourself permission for that. Yeah. And if you're someone that's like, you know what, I really do want to be in business, but I'm just burnt out. Go back and rewatch this and maybe really dig in and set a strategy session side of being like, why am I feeling this way? Like, what is the root cause? Because it could just be, you got to understand also your own personal body, right? For me, I start getting in a funk in the fall for no reason. Well, no reason. Hmm. Short days, weather is changing. Like it's almost like a Pavlonian response to the seasons changing. Just be in tune with that sort of stuff and don't make like life altering decisions just on a whim, but recognize emotions are valid, work with it, see where they're coming from and determine like, is this burnout, true burnout, or is this something that it's just frustration that I can fix? So, yeah. um, and it's not, a, it's not a clear path. It's not. And anyone trying to sell it to you is lying. Yeah. I love how you said earlier, it wasn't linear. It's like you're, it, the line goes straight up, down, backwards in a spiral backwards and then forwards in a spiral. And like, it's so freaking true. Um, and I, I love this. Um, there was something that like my uh, business coach, like I think it was like eight years ago now said to me that stuck with me. He's like, 
anything you choose in life as a job, as a career, um, is a shit sandwich. And what he means is that there's the top part is something that you like. Then the middle is something that you don't like. And then the, the underneath part is something that you like. So it's like, no matter what you choose, there's going to be something that you don't like about it and you have to choose your shit sandwich. So for example, if you want to be, um, a wedding photographer, that shoots a lot and also is has her own business and or his or her or they their business and connects with your clients and all of that and you know you want to do that but you don't want to be burnt out there are solutions for that and you just have to learn learn those like outsourcing you can get on my wait list by the way and I can coach you through how to get uh, get through burnout and not have to deal with it anymore. Right. So you can have that solution from someone who has been there before you, or you can be like, you know what, this isn't the shit sandwich I want. The shit sandwich I want is I want a to, shittier sandwich. <laughs> to just shoot for someone else, not have to deal with clients, not have to blog, not have to run a business at all, but just like be free to shoot for other people and just have that freedom. It's like, you know, internally what you really, really want Um, and at the end of the day, don't let fears hold you back from going after what you really want, because if you're scared to, you know, go after what you really want, um, and that, that stops you. Like, for example, if you're scared of starting to outsource and that's what's stopping you, then that's, you know, fear just shows you what you really want. Right. But if you're scared of, you know what, what I really want is, to shoot for other people and be an associate, but I'm scared of closing down my business because will other people actually want me to shoot for them? Then that fear is your compass. That means that you really do want that thing and it's just going to get in your way and roadblock you. So I love that you said that, that it's like at the end of the day, um, the fail, the only failure is if you're unhappy. Yeah. That was pretty much a mic drop. Like, I love that you said that it was incredible. (laughs) And I think honestly, the biggest rejection is telling yourself no, right? You know, we always hear make the ask, make the play, as long as you do it calculated and strategic, like we've talked about through this and that, you know, we feel like that's what we should be doing. Really, the, when you, when you filter yourself out from an opportunity, you're rejecting yourself. It's not anyone else. And that's the ultimate rejection is when, like you just said, your fear is your compass. When you're telling that compass to stop spinning, that's you causing it. You are rejecting you, nobody else. Yeah. And the only thing scarier in life is just living a life that you're not happy with. Right. <laughs> like that's the, that's the thing where whenever I'm scared, like, by the way, I'm like still scared to record podcast episodes. I'm like, st- like there's so many times I know that even for you, there's as you keep growing and growing to new heights in your business and entre- entrepreneurial journey, you're mm-hmm. scared of the next step. Right. But we do it anyway. Right. And it's, I, f- I now forget my point. I had a point and it went away. No, I just, you know, it's the adage of like the risk is, is well worth the reward, you know, and thing is, and we've heard it before, even if you fail in it, there's lessons in it, you know, like let's take the outsourcing aspect. You may outsource to someone, you may do all your diligence of all the things like we talked about here and you may get a shit outsourcer, right? But what are the lessons you can learn from that? Like always debrief all the actions that you do. It doesn't have to be like some crazy, like spreadsheet, all of that. Just sit down and go like, what did I have control of that I could have done different? and how maybe did I um, impact the action that I disliked in the outsourcer or the virtual assistant or whoever I hired and that will help to guide you in the next time so yeah I I think we don't like to fail but the biggest lessons and this came up earlier when you're talking I miss the days of when I was like trying to do all the things because I learned so much about myself and what I wanted in my business and what I didn't want mm-hmm. in my business. And there's so much value to that. So long as you keep focusing on that. Yeah, there is. And bet on, you can bet on yourself, right? Because we all have proof of us getting this far in life, right? And we've all had challenges we have had to overcome. And if you're scared of the next challenge, just bet on yourself because you've already done it. <laughs> yep. yep <All> right. Sure. <laughs> oh my gosh, Rachel, thank you so much. Um, also, before you go, I just want to make sure you let everybody know where they can find you, connect with you, and also uh, dive into your resources with the Law Talk. 
Yeah. So rachelbrinke.com is kind of the mothership website that'll filter you out, but you can go directly to the lawtog.com. We have the contracts education and the free legal roadmap. Grab that. That'll really help you if you're, especially if you're new in business or you're just trying to figure out what you need to do for your photography business. And then our Facebook group, just the law talk. It's incredible. I'm super active in it. I would love to see you guys there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rachel. Awesome. Have a good one. Yay. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and tuning into this episode. If you got value out of it, please feel free to message me on Instagram at Sarah Monica photo. That's Sarah, no H Monica with a K photo to let me know. I get so freaking energized hearing from others that what I've said has had a positive impact on their lives. Also, make sure to hit subscribe to the Shine and Thrive podcast to never miss an episode. I'm so grateful for you and I'm sending you all the productive vibes your way so you have the best week ever.